So this week, I'm pleased to introduce Mike Webster. So Mike, not a physicist, um, so uh, he's in the psychology department at the University of Nevada in Reno. Um, he's a, a vision expert, a neuroscientist, I guess. And he's, he's done a lot of work on vision and perception. And some of that work is in collaboration with Lord Whitehead, who's a member of our department. So uh, we had a great talk from Lauren a couple of years ago about the sort of physics of color. Uh, and Lauren suggested that we could get the sort of, you know, the sort of partner of that talk, if you like, which is, you know, the other part of perception, which is, you know, how the brain perceives and how the psychology works and what the neuroscience is. And there's nobody better to do that than, than Mike Webster. So, uh, so I'm very pleased that Mike has agreed to do that for us. So it's all yours, Mike. Well, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and share my screen. So can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, it's good. Okay, great. Okay, well, um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an incredible honor um, to be able to speak with you. And it's also a bit um, intimidating because, as Douglas mentioned, I'm not a physicist and I'm uh, or an astronomer, and my training's actually in psychology. But I work on a branch of psychology called psychophysics, which is the relationship between physical stimuli and then the perceptual experiences that we have to those. So it's really mapping the relationship between the stimuli reaching our senses and then the responses to them. And I think what makes me a psychologist rather than a neuroscientist is that most of the responses that I measure are behavioral ones. So I ask people what they're seeing or I have them do tasks where I can tell whether they're seeing them or not. And this is actually the oldest um, branch of experimental psychology. Um, and as Douglas also mentioned, I'm um, talking today from Reno, Nevada. So you probably most of you know where it is, but it's down here, right? Not too far from you. Um, in this corner of Nevada. And I certainly wouldn't call myself the world's expert in vision, but I think I'm one of the best in Northern Nevada. And um, anyway, I've been there since the nineties. And this was a sign that greeted me when I first drove. I was actually a postdoc at Cambridge for six years. And then I moved to Nevada. I didn't know very much about it. When I drove in from California, I saw this and I was delighted to see that the state of Nevada apparently has this really long history of vision and was proud enough to put it on their welcome sign. And at the same time, I was really surprised by that because I'm pretty sure when I entered Nevada back then, I was again, the only perceptual psychologist in the entire state. And so I wondered what happened to all the other vision researchers. And I got kind of worried when I got up close and saw all the bullet holes. Um, but anyway, this sign really symbolizes for me the questions I'm really interested in about the senses and it's particularly what my work is looking at is how are your sensory systems, and I look at vision, but it's true of all the senses, how are they molded by the environment or the world that they're actually operating in? And that happens over many scales from evolution to online adjustments that they're constantly making in order to optimize themselves for the particular environment that they're in. So as this prospector is looking out on this beautiful panorama and wondering how he's going to pillage it, at that same time, that environment is somehow shaping the way his brain's responding and literally affecting the way that he sees the world around him. And those are the questions that I mainly look at is how, do, how does the brain actually calibrate itself depending on the um, visual environment that it's in. And the main form of calibration, there's many different ways it does this. The main kind that I look at are these short-term adjustments known as adaptation, where the system basically changes its sensitivity depending on the context that it's in. And it turns out your vision, even though you don't really feel it, is constantly adjusting all the time and constantly, again, adapting and changing the way it's responding. And just as one example, if you stare at this um, blue cross here, try to keep your eye right on that then each part of your eye is basically adapting to a different amount of light on the screen. And if you keep fixating on that, then when I switch to the blank screen, if you blink your eyes, you might be able to see an after image. And I suppose it only works if you have faith. Um, but you might've been able to see something like this. 
And what's going on is if you fixate this point, then one part of your eye actually thinks it's dark outside. So it becomes more sensitive, just like a camera would. Other parts of your eye think it's bright outside because locally it is bright. And so they're going to become less sensitive. And so now when you switch to this blank screen, the cells or the mechanisms in your brain that were exposed to the dark area, they're going to respond more. And so that part of the screen is going to look brighter than this. So the after image you get is called a negative after effect. And that's very typical of these adaptation effects. And in general, things look less like what you've adapted to. And because you moved your eyes around a little, it probably didn't look this crisp, it looked blurry. And also because it's stabilized and not temporally changing um, because it's fixed on your eye. Well, anyway, once you know how these are made, it's kind of fun to do these on your own. And since somebody already tried it with Christ, I decided to try it with the devil. And so this is my daughter. And once again, if you fixate this cross here, then different parts of your eye are adapting to the different amounts of light on the screen. And again, if I flip to the uh, blank slide, it helps to blink your eyes to revive it, but you should be able to see that um, positive or the negative of what you just adapted to. So the positive image of her. <clears throat> well, the next point I wanna make is that even though these kind of simple light adaptation have been very widely studied, it turns out that this adaptation is happening throughout the brain at all different stages. So we can see these kind of after effects, not for just simple patterns like brightness or color, but for even complex or very abstract properties. And the brain seems to adapt to them in very similar ways. So this adaptation seems to be almost kind of a canonical mechanism or process that's shaping how the brain works. And the fact that we adapt to different things is just because different parts of the brain, different levels of the visual system are coding different kinds of information, but they're still adapting in fundamentally the um, same way. And so for example, if the light adaptation effects I just showed you, we know for a number of reasons that those are mainly happening down in the retina itself and largely in the receptors that are first absorbing the light. But there's other kinds of after effects like this one's a motion after effect. So if you just keep staring at the center of this pattern now, you're adapting to this expanding spiral and there are cells in your brain that code different directions or types of motion and they're being adapted as you look at this. And so when I switch back to the static spiral now, it should look like it's actually compressing. So right now there's no motion changing on the screen. That's an illusion your brain is basically building because I've adapted out the expansion. So a static stimulus again, looks like it's um, contracting. And we know from many different sources of evidence that the human visual system doesn't even code motion until you get back up into the cortex. And part of this adaptation to that um, expanding spiral is actually happening even further up along this pathway here in areas that are seem to be specialized for encoding motion. And there's all sorts of other areas that are specialized for different things along both of these pathways and will specifically adapt to the properties that they're designed to represent. Well, because of these adaptation effects are so powerful, they've actually been called the psychologist's electrode. And the idea of that is I could adapt you to some sort of pattern and then I could look at how your perception changes. And then from those changes, I could work back out and figure out, okay, what was inside your head that changed its sensitivity? So I could ask questions like how many cells, for example, are representing different directions of motion and how narrowly tuned for different directions they are and so on. And so this is actually one of the most common psychophysical techniques where I can basically change again how you see things and then have you tell me what those changes are and then try to infer what's going on inside your head. And just one example of a classic um, case of this is a study from Blakemore and Campbell at Cambridge in the 60s where what they did was measure your ability to see different sizes or spatial frequencies. So measuring again, how sensitive are you to small contrast changes depending on the size of the pattern. And that gives you a measure of what's called the contrast sensitivity function. And then what they did was adapt people to just a single size and then remeasure this. And what they found is if you adapt it to this one size, it just produced a local loss in sensitivity, didn't have an effect on um, sizes that were very much smaller or larger. And so this was actually evidence that pointed to the idea 
that your visual system is almost coding different sizes in terms of multiple channels and gave rise to the idea that the visual system is actually doing something almost like a Fourier analysis where it's decomposing the image into these different spatial frequency channels, very similar to the way that the auditory system is breaking down sounds into different uh, frequency ranges. Um, but in my own work, um, even though I've done a lot of that, I've over time got more and more interested in really just trying to understand why is the system adapting, what's the purpose of it, and what are the implications of it for understanding how we experience the world around us. And in particular, um, I've been interested in sort of natural states of adaptation, like what's going on when you're really walking around in the world, and the question of whether you and I actually see the world in the same way. And part of the answer to that, I think, is even though we can never really know what someone else is experiencing, I think we can legitimately say that to the extent that you and I are in the same visual environment, our brains are gonna be adapted in ways where our experiences actually converge and we're gonna be very similar compared to our physiological differences. And so I'm gonna show one set of experiments where I talk about taking people who are very different, but adapt them to the same environment and then seeing how similar their perceptual experience is. And then the other set of experiments I'll look at is if you take the same person now and put them in different environments, what's that going to do? And that predicts in that case that their perception should actually change because now their brain is being adapted or calibrated for a very different world. Um, so just some examples of how we differ, obviously that happens throughout the visual system. It starts as early as the optics of the eye. And so nobody has perfect optics. Everybody on the back of the eye, the image is gonna be blurred for different reasons. And one thing we've studied over several years now is the perception of image blur and to what extent you're adapted so that you don't actually see your own blur so that you can represent the spatial structure of the outside world correctly. And so one way we do this is just to take an image like this, and then we can just vary the amplitude spectrum, the relative amount of higher or low spatial frequencies. And we can either blur the image so there's less high frequency, less fine detail, or we can actually um, make the amplitude spectrum more shallow so we're actually sharpening the image and it's now too sharp. And the task of the subject in this case is simply to say which of these images looks correctly focused, neither too blurred nor too sharp. And so here's an example of these blur adaptation effects. If you stare at this um, center spot here, then the image on the left and the right are physically focused. But now if you keep looking at that spot on the left side, you're seeing a blurred image and on the right side, you're seeing a sharpened image. And now if you keep looking at that spot, please, when I switch back to the original images, the one on the right should look relatively more blurred to you. And so once again, that's the case. We know in fact that this is an adaptation that again is not happening until the visual cortex um, because of the properties that it has and uh, what we know about how information is coded at that level of the brain. But here again, this is a case where you're basically adapting to a very important property of the world and a property that primarily varies not so much because of the world itself, but because of the optical quality of your eye varies. And this shows that these are very reliable effects. If you've adapted to blurred images, then the a focus image will actually look too sharp. You have to physically add in some blur to cancel that out. Whereas if you're adapted to a sharpened image, you get the opposite effect. Now we can also look at these effects in terms of the actual optical quality of observers. So there's different ways we can specify what the um, wavefront aberrations of a um, optical system are in terms of the Zernike coefficient. So these were things like astigmatism and defocus are the things that your optometrist would normally try to correct for. But then there's all sorts of higher order aberrations too. And I've been really fortunate to be able to work with Susanna Marcos at the Institute of Optics in Madrid, who's a real expert in the um, optics of the human eye. And she uses a technique which several people um, in my field used now, which was actually borrowed from astronomy. So you, may have be familiar with it. It's called adaptive optics. And the idea is that you can measure the optical aberrations in the system and then use a deformable mirror to correct for those and basically remove them. And vision scientists started using this technique about 20 or 25 years ago. And the real advantage here is you can correct for the eyes aberrations and either look into the eye with very little blur or even stimulate the eye with um, patterns now they've gotten to the point where you can now 
shine a light that's so well focused that you can stimulate a single receptor. And so there's some amazing psychophysics going on right now where you're asking what happens when just a single cell in your visual system responds? What does it, what sensations do you have? Um, so anyway, this is actually the first images that were collected with this system and it's showing the receptor mosaic at the back of the eye. And then they came up with some clever techniques to figure out what kind of receptors these were. Um, but the way we've used it is basically, or, and I should really say this, Susanna doing this, is we can precisely measure people's optical aberrations. And then with this adaptive optic systems, we can correct it, or I could take my aberrations and show them to you and ask, what does the, what experience of blur do you have when you're looking through the optics of my eye? And these are different, um, basically point spread functions for different individuals who are all considered to have pretty good vision. And this is how the image would be blurred by these different um, blur functions. So this person has very good vision, this person has much poorer vision. But then we can ask people, what level of blur looks correctly focused to you? And that's almost exactly predicted from the native blur in your eye. And so what that predicts is what you experience as being focused has already taken into account the amount of blur that's present in your eye. And we can further show that this is not just that you've kind of learned, that's what I'm always seeing, that's what I expect. We can show it's actually how your visual system's calibrated. So we can use that AO system, for example, if this is the actual native blur or aberration pattern for this observer, we can use adaptive optics to either amplify that blur or turn it down, make the image sharper. And then we can basically adapt this person now to either more or less blur than they're used to experiencing. And when we do that, we find in fact that the image blur that you're not adapted to, that's by definition what you're already calibrated for is the native amount of blur you have. So again, that says that your sensitivity has somehow been corrected so that even though you and I probably have very different visual quality reaching our retina, we're gonna see the world to a large extent the same way because the brain has basically discounted that through adaptation. Now, another way where we differ a lot is in our color vision. And this is something I've been incredibly lucky to be able to work a lot with Lauren on. Um, and this is also a highly adaptable property of your visual system. So if you just look at the center of these four squares here, then again, each part of your eye now, instead of just adapting, whether it's bright or dark, one corner seeing a red world, one green and so on. And now when I switch to the squares, again, you'll should see these color after images, which are the opposite of the color that you adapted to. So this is again, really relevant for understanding what's happening to different people, because again, our sensitivity to color dram varies dramatically from one person to the next. And this is a depressing example of this. This is what's happening to your lens as you're aging naturally, that when you're young, the lens is very clear, but over time it builds up a pigment, which basically filters short wavelength light. And so your lens that you're looking through as you get older is getting yellower and yellower. And if you didn't adapt or correct for that change in the optics of your eye, then if this is what a picture looked like when you were younger, this is what it should look like when you're older because there's now much less short wavelength bluish light getting back um, to your receptors. But if you actually ask people who are older to describe their color experiences, they're actually incredibly similar to younger observers. And so that's expected again, if the visual system is somehow adapting out or compensating for this change in the light spectrum so that gray continues to look gray, for example. Um, here's another um, case where we've looked at this, um, which I wasn't my idea, so I can say it was just a really beautiful natural experiment that my colleague Jack Werner came up with who's at UC Davis. Um, and it was to look at what happens to your vision following cataract surgery, because you can think of the cataract as being a very dense yellow lens. And when you remove that and replace it with a clear lens, again, you're basically giving somebody an entirely new visual system. How do they see the world? And so these are studies where we looked at those changes in color perception. And I should really say it was all his work. They wouldn't even let me help with the surgeries. Uh, but the idea is that before cataract surgery, again, your sensitivity to short wavelengths is very low. When you put in a clear lens, it's much higher, much more of those short wavelengths are getting through. And the people report the world looks very bright and very blue to them. And what we did was just track their changes, ask them what looks gray to you over time. 
And interestingly, it took weeks or even months for them to start returning to the point where they were describing colors the same way through their new lens that they were through their old lens. So again, just within this person, we could see how they were recalibrating to adjust and compensate for their own spectral sensitivity. One other case I'd like to mention on this that we're currently doing a lot of work on is looking at color deficiencies and to what extent someone who has a color deficiency might actually be adapting and adjusting and compensating for that. And I don't know what your background is on color vision, but just um, briefly, the way that we see color is by having three kinds of cone receptors that are sensitive to different but overlapping parts of the visible spectrum. So one set of cones sees mainly what we would call bluish light, and then these other two see longer wavelengths. And so this gives us sort of three samples of the spectrum instead of one. And my best, uh, my favorite example of the value of color vision comes from the British television license. So I'm assuming you don't have this in Canada, but I'd never heard of it until I moved to Cambridge and was a postdoc and was horrified to learn that I actually had to pay to watch um, for television. And um, we were pretty poor at the time. And I can remember that reached a point where I thought, you know, do I want to watch television or do I want to get my kids a Christmas present? And I ended up giving them a license in their stocking. Um, but when I looked at these licenses, um, I was really impressed that you know, they're still um, do this. This is the current rates that I looked up. And it turns out that if you want to watch a color television, it's exactly three times as much as the cost of watching a black and white TV. And I don't even know where you get one of those anymore. And so someone was very, whoever came up with this rates understood color vision really well, because by having these three receptors, you really are getting three times as much information. And it makes sense to charge people that much. The part that doesn't make sense on this license, and this is true, if you look on the back, it says that if you're blind, you get a 50% discount. And what that means is that it costs more for a blind person to listen to a color television than it does for a sighted person to watch a black and white television. And so that just seems crazy to me. That makes Brexit seem like a good idea. And I don't know why they um, do that. Uh, but it turns out that people can vary in their color vision and the amount of vision they have in lots of different ways. And so most people are what we call normal trichromats. They have the three classes of cones, but then you can have people who are entirely missing one of the cones, they're dichromats, or you can have more commonly people that have three cones, but the longer wave ones are very similar in how they capture the light. And that means that the difference signal between them is much smaller. So these predict basically that reds and greens should look much weaker to you. And you can go on lots of websites and it'll say like, what does the world look like to someone who's color deficient? And typically what they do is they just take an image that um, we might see, and then they filter it for the change in the pigments that the anomalous observer has. And the problem with this interpretation is this is what the world should look like to you if I just suddenly swapped out your photo pigments for theirs but they've had a lifetime of adapting to these pigments. And if, again, if they're just getting a weaker red green signal from their receptors, there's no reason why post-receptoral neurons couldn't turn up that contrast or gain and amplify that, predicting that they might see the world more similarly to normal trichromats again than you'd predict just from their cone sensitivities. And there's several different labs that are studying this now. And here's just one example where what they did was just show people lots of different colors and just say, how different do these two colors look? And based on their photo pigments, you'd expect that these anomalous observers should see very little difference between reds and greens, but their ratings are almost the same as normal. So they're seeing just as much red green difference, at least in their reports as someone with normal trichromacy, which is consistent with, again, them just sort of amplifying or adapting to that signal and compensating for it. In these cases, it's really hard to say, well, are they really seeing reds and greens better or they've just learned that that's how pe other people label the world or maybe they're just saying this is the most red and green I've ever seen. So I'm mean, scaling things subjectively like that. But we have a paper that just came out where we tried to find objective evidence for this. And we're using a technique called fMRI, which you um, use a standard MRI um, machine, and then you can basically 
as people are looking at things, you can measure changes in blood flow. So this is called functional MRI, and you can use that as a measure of how much activity the brain is generating for um, when you're doing different kinds of things. And what we showed from this, in fact, is if we just show these anomalous observers, these red green patterns, we can measure the contrast response. How is the brain activity changing as we increase the red green difference? And in the earliest visual area, the first cortical area, the response is just about what you predict from their color losses. But the, by the time you get a little further up into the visual system, we can't even see a difference between normals anymore. And so this again suggests that somewhere in the cortex, there is an amplification going on, which is again, just what you'd expect from the fact that the brain of these individuals is going to adapt just as a, a normal trichromat's brain would. So again, those are just examples of the idea that all of us are physiologically, optically, and neurally very different from each other. And I think the fact that we can even sit around and talk about our percepts at all and have kind of a shared language for them is because we're actually adapted to the same world and that's calibrating us. And we're still gonna be very different in a lot of ways, but at least in some ways, like for example, what looks gray is gonna be much less different between us than you'd predict from the large individual differences between us. Um, but that same process is gonna actually cause you and I to have different percepts if we're exposed to different environments because now we're going to be calibrated um, to different worlds. And it's often hard, I know for my students, when I tell them about individual differences, it's hard for them to even conceive of the idea that people don't see the world the way I do because you just sort of think that your vision is objective and veridical. And so why wouldn't it be for everyone? And it's only when an image like this comes along that people realize that, wow, people really could be seeing the world differently than I am. And I'm assuming most of you have seen this was a dress image that came out about five years ago, where about half the people say that the stripes of this dress look gold and white, and the other half are convinced it looks blue and black. And we were one of the actually first people to have a publication on this. Um, and like many other people, what we pointed out is that it's not that people are seeing blue differently in the stripes. It's more a matter of how you're attributing where did that blue come from. And the idea is if you think you're seeing the dress in direct sunlight, then you think that you're, the blue that you're seeing is actually a property of the dress. Whereas if you think that you're seeing the dress in shadow, then you think that the blue is a property of the lighting and not the dress. And the dress image just happens to be very ambiguous about what the um, lighting was. But there's a case again where basically the differences are really because of how people are interpreting this image. And even something as simple sounding as judging color and brightness is an incredibly complex process and has all kinds of intuitions built into it. So here's a famous example from Ted Adelson. This A and B square are exactly the same intensity on the screen, but we just, without even thinking about it, unconsciously something has told us that I'm getting as much light from this square as I am from this one, yet this one is in shadow. Therefore, there's its reflectance must be higher. And so the paint that I perceive this to be is gonna be much um, lighter. And here's another example of how complex these inferences are. So in this image here, you see a bump and a dent, and here you see a dent and a bump, hopefully. Well, these are exactly the same image. I just rotated one upside down. And same thing here, these are the same image, it's just rotated. And what's going on here is that the visual system has this really strong expectation that the lighting's coming from above. So if the shadowing's at the bottom, that would be consistent with a dent, whereas if the shadow's at the top, sorry, a bump of the shadows at the top, that would be consistent with an indentation. And again, this is a, something that we're constantly faced with all the time. So in this image here, it's very easy to just discount this shadow as being part of the lighting and not really part of the object. And you might not have even noticed it. Whereas if I just mirror the two halves of the face, then this is no longer consistent with lighting. And so we switch to seeing it as being part of the pigmentation. <clears throat> 
And the point of the dress, the reason it produced such ambiguous person is because shadows tend to be blue, right? Because the directional light's coming from the yellow sun. So when we look at um, blue shadows, the visual system really discounts that blueness a lot. And even when you see the blueness, it's very easy just to imagine that that blue is really coming from the shading and not from the snow. And if I just invert that color, it's very hard to imagine that that yellow is a shadow now. And here's a few other examples of this. It's very easy for me at least to imagine that this is a white room in blue light, but here I've just inverted the colors. I can't perceive this as a white room in orange light myself. And here, even when we just um, inverted the colors here, we went from this sort of achromatic silver to what looks like a really clearly colored bronze or copper. And same thing with these coins. And interestingly for me, at least, um, even when I turn up the blue really high, I still see these as silver coins in blue light. So I'm attributing the blueness to the lighting. Whereas if I just flip the colors around, I see these as being yellow coins in white light. So there's this really amazing asymmetry between blue and yellow. And this is what we showed with the dress that people have real disagreement when they're looking at the original image. And even if I turned up the blue three times, I was still finding about a third of people still said these were white stripes on the dress, not because they couldn't see the blue, but because they couldn't, they thought the blue was coming from the lighting. The minute we flipped it to yellow, everybody agreed that the dress itself was yellow. So anyway, that was kind of a digression from what I was supposed to be talking about, but it's the only thing I've ever done that was important enough to get into 17.com, so I'm kind of proud of it. Um, but I want to get back now to look at this idea that the world itself can actually vary a lot in its color. So how do we, um, what are the implications for that for how people experience color? And there's actually been studies where they've, turns out if you stick your graduate student in a red or green room for a week, then sure enough, their color vision will change. And in our studies, we wanted to know, well, what about the real world? Does it vary enough in color for place to another that we could find that people living in these different color environments see color um, differently. And so this is work we did over several trips um, to India in a location conveniently close to where my wife grew up. So these are the Western Ghats outside of Mumbai. And the first time I went there was during the monsoon and I was just overwhelmed how lush and green it was. And then on a later trip, we went back during their winter dry season, and it was just a completely different environment of the color scheme had just radically changed, even though this is the same valley. And we were able to work with people who are mainly farmers, so they were immersed in these natural colors in ways that you and I probably aren't now because we spend so much time uh, indoors and in sort of artificial environments. And so once again, the colors that they're exposed to would change a lot depending on where they live and um, what the things like the seasons were. So anyway, to do these studies, we packed up some equipment and then we hired some help. And then again, we made um, several different trips to India, some of the most fun I've ever had. And through my wife, I got to meet amazing people like these Indian sadhus. And to me, it's just remarkable that if you ask them about their Hinduism and Buddhism, the basic tenets of that, the things they're sitting around talking about are very similar to what I talk about with my colleagues at conferences, like what's the nature of the sensory representations we have? Are they just an illusion or are they telling us something about reality? And in fact, I think the only real difference between these Indian holy men and a lot of us is that they're not locked into the cycle of rebirth and suffering that a lot of us are in because they don't have to apply for grants. Um, but anyway, part of these measurements were um, just to say, well, how much does the world vary? So we spent a lot of time calibrating cameras and things so we could basically collect measurements of the scene statistics and then go back and analyze those. Um, this image is just to show my colleague in this work and also the love of my life you really can't buy a better radiometer. Um, but anyway, once we made those measurements, we could take them back into my lab, expose people to palettes of colors drawn from different environments, like an arid or more lush one, and then look at how their color perception changes. And we've shown, in fact, that if you're exposed to a particular distribution of colors, you lose sensitivity to that distribution. So again, there seem to be channels tuned to different kinds of hues even. And so depending on what hues you're exposed to, you become less sensitive to those. And so in the natural world, 
some scenes are very, have a very strong bias going from like uh, blue sky to dead grass. That'd be a good Nevada scene. And if you're looking at that distribution again, what we find is you not only adapt to the average color, but you also selectively lose sensitivity to this direction. It becomes harder to see blues and yellows compared to these other colors. And so it is suggesting that you're gonna be strongly adapted to the environment. And the work I've done with um, Lauren has really been um, his work really, I feel guilty that I'm on some of those papers, is that um, to apply a lot of these ideas and use them to really kind of build sensible predictions about how we should be talking about color and modeling it. Well, the other thing we wanted to do was ask, what about people in those environments? Can we show somehow that their color is being shaped by that? And this turned out to be a lot harder than I thought. Like we wanted to know what this person thought about color, but it was really hard to do that without other people looking on. And sometimes we had a whole village looking on and if the guy chose the wrong color, then the crowd could get pretty hostile. But from these measurements, we were able to actually show that there are reliable differences between different populations. And this has been shown qualitatively by having people name colors, but we could show quantitatively that for example, what the average person in Reno, Nevada would say is a pure yellow is going to be too um, greenish for someone who lives in India on average. So very um, clear biases in their color perception. Now we couldn't, uh, it's a real disappointment to me that I couldn't actually tie those to things like seasonal variations. I was hoping I'd be able to see a sort of waxing and waning of their color perception across the year. Um, but a few years ago, there's actually a study out of York University in England where they did find that students there actually, their color perception changed with the seasons. And that was a real surprise to me because again, I lived in England for six years and I didn't think they had seasons. Um, okay, so I want to go on now to another example of where we've looked at individual differences in perception, and this is actually in face perception. How do you experience the faces that you're looking at, and how do you even adapt to something like that? And around the time I started this work, um, several, many years ago, the Queen was actually um, sitting for a portrait by an artist, Lucian Freud, who's actually the grandson of Sigmund Freud. And he died a few years ago, unfortunately, but at the time he was considered the greatest living portrait artist in England. And she sat something like 80 different times to have this portrait um, painted. And this is what um, she ended up with. And I never heard what the royal family thought about it, but I collected some of the comments that were in the British tabloids. And basically people were pretty upset. They said, you know, how could you paint our monarch um, to look like that? And the one quote that I liked more than any other was this one that when she, she should have known what she was getting into when she hired this guy, because this is his self portrait and you can see that they look very similar stylistically. And so it just got me thinking, you know, that when I look at these paintings, they're sort of the first time I've ever seen them and I'm kind of overwhelmed by the common style. But what about Freud? He spent day after day staring at this face. My guess is he would have seen this face in ways that you and I never could, simply again, because his brain is somehow adapted to that stimulus in ways that we're not. So we started studying these face adaptation effects. And the way we did it originally was just to take a um, normal face like this, and then we could distort it in different ways by, for example, bringing the eyes closer together or farther apart, or we could um, vary the separation between the eyes and the mouth and things. And when I did this, I actually um, wrote my ex-friends in Cambridge, and I told them I discovered something amazing. No matter how you distort a normal face, it starts to look more British. But in the actual experiments, what we did was to basically, again, this is an undistorted face, and then we would have people look at a contracted face, for example, like this. And to me, it's still amazing that when, when I first see this face, it looks strongly distorted. But the longer I look at it, the less distorted. I can almost sort of feel it pulling back apart. And it's becoming sort of more like an average face to me. And so if this is becoming my average, then when I switch back to the original face, it should look like it's now been expanded. And in fact, that's what we found quite large effects. So if I had adapted to that contracted face, which is shown here, and then asked people to judge the appearance of the original face, that face now looked much too wide. And they had to basically, again, add in a physical 
contraction in order to cancel that out. And it's actually quite remarkable that with these after effects, you can add a physical stimulus to cancel out the, um, uh, <clears throat> the after effect, which says that your brain is really treating that after effect as if it is a real physical stimulus. It can't tell the difference um, between them. Um, well, this is, turns out as an example of an effect that's happening quite high up in the visual system. And these are called high level after effects. And what it just means is that we're really now starting to adapt to much more abstract properties of the world than simple things like the local color or brightness. And my favorite example of this was a study by Watson and Clifford at Sydney University. And what they did was repeat our experiment, but with the clever twist that they adapted to a face tilted one way and then tested with a face rotated 90 degrees. And the logic of this is if you were just adapting to the spatial distortion on the screen, then after adapting to this, this face should be pulled in that same angle along this diagonal here. But if instead you're adapting a level of the brain where you're representing an object independent of your own egocentric viewpoint, then the adaptation should act, effect should actually rotate with the object, which is what they found. And we know that early levels of the visual system do code things in terms of the position on the eye or the retinotopic coordinates. And it's not until you get up into these later regions where you start representing objects more in terms of world-centric coordinates independent of your own perspective. Now, once again, we can ask, those were just arbitrary distortions. So we can ask, you know, does the real world vary enough to real faces vary enough that you would adapt differently to faces depending on who your social environment is. And so these are the same face on the left and right here. And to test this, what we did was just to see how, what happens if you adapt to actual photographs of people. And these aren't actual photographs. This was formed by actually averaging together um, Clinton and Trump. Um, but if you stare at this um, blue spot here in this case, then on the left side, you're adapting to Clinton's face. And on the right side, you're adapting to Trump's face, just when you thought you'd never have to see him again. And now if I switch back to those blended images, then the one on the left should look more like Trump and the one on the left should look more like Clinton. And hopefully um, you could see those effects. And the way we'd study these was to just use neutral, unfamiliar faces, but we would just show things like a, a male or a female face, and then we would have an androgynous face. And the task of the subject, just as I showed with that focus point, the subject would have to vary and say, when does the face look equally likely to be male or female? And we wanted to know how that would be biased. And these are again, very pronounced effects after even just, uh, <clears throat> in fact, I spent a lot of time adapting to these images. And then the next paper that came out spent about five seconds as was getting effects as big as I found. So that was very disheartening. Um, but again, it's a case where your brain is really rapidly recalibrating to this much more high level property. And here's another um, really beautiful example of this. So just keep looking at the center cross here. And now the faces that you're seeing out in your periphery are actual photographs. They haven't been distorted at all, but as it keeps going, they're going to look more and more distorted, almost like cartoon characters. And what's going on there is that, again, as each face pops up, it's being represented relative to the adaptation that's been driven by the previous faces. And what that does is really exaggerate how does that face differ from the previous faces um, that you were adapted to. And to me, um, again, when I started looking at these face adaptation effects, I was just amazed how similar they were in, in the kind of form and behavior as they were to simple properties like color. And it suggests that the brain really sort of uses the same basic strategies to represent very different kinds of information. And the way we represent faces is actually very similar, we think, to how we represent color. So in color, we think that basically you code colors by asking, how does it differ from gray? And the current models we have of face perception is that we represent faces also on a relative scale, that we have some kind of prototype in our head for what an average face is. And then each individual we ask, how does that person differ again from the average? And, and they even talk in face literature about things like identity trajectories. So these three individuals here correspond to deviations in different directions away from the average face. And that's very similar to different hues like red, green, or blue in color space. 
Whereas if you move along one of these trajectories, what you're really doing is amplifying that same identity, making it um, stronger. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening when you make a caricature of a face. So if you wanna make a monstrous version of these individuals, then what you do is you just turn up specifically, how does this face differ from the average and just um, exaggerate those differences. Um, well, again, um, I'm basically a vision scientist. I'm not a social psychologist. And, but because faces are so important to us, it, this adaptation really has a lot of implications, I think, for how people respond and interact with other people. And we've shown that almost every dimension that you can judge about a person, even things like trustworthiness, we didn't do this work, but other people have has shown that even that's very adaptable. And just as one example, um, it turns out that if you study what makes an attractive face, and it turns out attractive faces are simply average faces. So if I were just to blend all these individuals together, then the average is going, most people would rate that as looking better than any of the individuals. So it's becoming more like the prototype in the center of that space. And the point of adaptation is adaptation is the thing that's actually setting that center because we're all exposed to a different set of faces. So our average is going to be different. So you can find lots of examples where you can see what's the average face in a different location in the world for example. And the point is, it, this might be the prototype, the adaptation point in all these different locations. And a kind of nice example of this was the anthropologist Malinowski, who um, <clears throat> worked back when it was okay to call people savages. And he did these beautiful ethnographic studies in the Trobriand Islands. And he said, when he first got there, he'd ask like, who's the most attractive person in the village? And they wouldn't, and he didn't agree with their judgments. But then he noticed that over time when they said, you know, this person's the most attractive, he thought, I'm starting to see that the same way. And this has always been interpreted that his criteria for beauty actually changed. But what I think is going on is that his criteria was staying constant, beautiful is just average. And what was changing was his visual coding. He was now adapting to a different populations of faces. And so that was recalibrating his um, face coding. And anyway, we may even be adapted to the own, our own familial um, facial characteristics. And that may be why people tend to be attracted to people that look like them, or might even be attracted to dogs that look like them. Um, so I know we're getting close to the hour. I'm gonna let you stop me if you need um, to stop at any particular point. I hope I don't have more than about um, 10 minutes left. But the point of all this is that this adaptation, again, is really strongly affecting how we see almost every property, of, I believe, of the world. And the real point of it, again, is that whether you and I see the same is really going to depend on whether we've been adapted to the same environment or different environments. And I just want to end by looking at some, another question that we've started working on, partly with Lauren, which is the fact that even though a lot of people in my field talk about natural environments, very few people actually live in natural environments. We all live in these um, carpenter worlds now that we've created. And there's really interesting questions about how do the senses that evolved in one environment, how are they going to be um, able to cope with totally new environments that we put ourselves in? And so for example, NASA spends millions of dollars trying to ask how are the senses going to adjust when we start sending people in space? I was actually um, putting these slides together last night and I had this one up and my wife walked in the room and she ran over and she said, oh my God, what is that? And for a second, I thought I'd stumbled across a way to bring a little excitement back into our marriage, but she was actually really upset about it. And I had to explain that, you know, the government funded this work. But anyway, we've gotten more and more interested in trying to understand well, what is the um, going on when we start sticking people in these unnatural worlds, what's going to happen to their vision. And one project that I've been doing with Lauren is looking at the next generation of lighting that we're all going to be potentially exposed to, which uses LEDs, which are more narrow band. And so they can actually amplify the color differences. And if we're under those, it raises all kinds of important questions about what's going to happen to our color perception. So for example, if I had a set of surfaces under traditional lighting, and then I now look at those same surfaces with this LED lighting, it might produce a real expansion in the red green. And we predict that you're going to adapt to that. So if you're under that lighting and you walked outside, the world might start looking more washed out to you. And at least in the lab so far, we've actually seen these kind of effects.
The other case where we've been looking at this a lot is in um, medical image perception. And it turns out that still, even though there's all kinds of image processing and machine learning now, much of radiology is still based on people making subjective visual judgments about images. And radiologists will spend hours at a time staring at these images and they have their own particular statistical properties. So that predicts that the brain should be adapted to them. So the work we've done on this is mainly with mammograms. One thing that radiologists do is they classify the tissue as being either dense or fatty. And that's really important because it has an implications for what kind of follow-up tests they might do. And so the first thing we did was just ask, well, do you actually adapt with your ratings change depending on what you're exposed to previously? And so to did this again, we again created blends between a fatty and dense image. And so this is an example here. And these are the same image on the left and right. And now I'm adapting you to a dense image on the left and a fatty image on the right. And if I switch back now, then the image on the right should look more fatty or cloudy to you. And it turns out there's no protocols in place right now to even tell radiologists, like, should I worry about these adaptation effects? Should I order my images in particular ways? I'm gonna skip this. Um, but you not only adapt to the textures of the image, but also they're blurrier than natural images. You adapt to the blur and your sensitivity to sizes or scales in those images is even affected by the blur you're adapting to. And finally, we've even shown that this adaptation basically allows you to get information more quickly out of these images. And that's exactly what a radiologist is trying to do. They wanna look at this image and say, is there something there that shouldn't be? And by, we've shown that if you're first adapted to these kinds of images, it becomes easier to find a target than if you're um, adapted to the wrong set of images. And um, again, those are very um, unnatural experiments that were done with radiologists. But amazingly, um, my colleague Craig Abbey and some others have actually gone back and looked at um, radiological records. And again, they read often batches of images and they've shown things like over time, they were trying to test to see whether you got more fatigued and got worse the longer you were looking at images. And instead what they found is you actually get better. So you're just as good at detecting a cancer when it's there, but you're less likely to have a false alarm, call someone back when they did it. And this is also shown in this recent study by Craig Abby again, where he showed that basically you not only get better at spotting things, but you get um, quicker at it too. And so that can, <clears throat> given the amount of screening that's done, even a tiny effect like that can have just enormous um, consequences for both health and cost. Okay, last um, point I want to make is just, well, why is the visual system adapting? And there's many different reasons for that. One is that we are kind of like a camera. We only have a narrow operating range, and so we need to center that on whatever the dynamic range of the stimulus is. Another, as I've shown you, is this adaptation is a way of kind of discounting things. Like if your lens gets yellower, you can adapt that out and that can lead to perceptual quantity. You see the things the same, even though say you're changing. Um, and another is that this adaptation, and this is the one I'm most interested in, is really sort of a way of building a prediction about the world. And this is my favorite illustration of this. If you stare real intently at this center cross, so try to keep your eye really still on that, then those purple spots will actually start to fade away. And the only thing you'll see is the green spot going around. And to me, this is a real metaphor of what's going on in your brain all the time, that as you adapt to something, it's actually fading out of your consciousness. You now expect that property, so there's no reason to explicitly represent it. And your brain is really just set up to represent the unexpected things, the surprises, the statistical outliers. And I believe that that's happening with everything. So I think even as you walk around now, the things you notice are really an adaptation after effect. Your attention is drawn to what's the thing that I didn't already think was going um, to be there. And just as the very last thing, um, just to illustrate this idea, we've started playing around with the idea that to the extent that we actually know how the brain adapts, we could start adapting images instead of people to simulate what would these images look like if you really had been fully or completely adapted to them. So this is a very simple model based on color vision. But basically we just collect the statistics of different natural environments, either ones we had calibrated or ones where we just go out and say, okay, 
find some pictures on the internet from different places. And then we pass them through this model. And the idea of the adaptation is very simple. It's that each neuron in that model is going to gain control. So its average activity in one environment is going to be the same as it was in a previous environment. And these are the kind of images we get out of this. And my point is just that these really emphasize that what adaptation does is it tones down the dominant characteristics that you're adapted to. It's kind of filtering those out of your mind. And what it's really emphasizing is the novel, the uncharacteristic properties. So if you live in a dry environment, greens really do stand out. At least that's our prediction. And we can even do this with paintings. So we can adapt here. I've taken Monet's painting and say, what would this look like if you were completely adapted to that world so that the responses are the same that you get to a natural outdoor scene, or we can even swap the palettes of different artists. Um, and this is my last example. This is our prediction of what Mars is gonna look like when your grandkids move there. And we call it the red planet, but it's not gonna be red to them because when they're living there, they're going to adapt to the average color and it's going to look very similar to the color scheme on Earth. And people are, you know, eventually we are going to start living on Mars. You probably heard there was this Mars One project, which unfortunately turned out, I think, to be a scam. But they, um, the plan was to basically send a, a colony to Mars on a one-way mission, and they would just live there. And you have to think about it, over 200,000 people applied to get on this ship and leave Earth and um, this was before the pandemic, you know, they really wanted to get out of here. Um, God knows how many people would apply now. Um, but it just turns out, um, coincidentally, that what they whittled it down to 100 finalists. And one of them is actually from Reno, Nevada. And I don't know how they picked these people. Maybe they thought if we send someone to Mars from Reno, at least they won't get homesick. But the more important question to me is, why are all these people, why does she want to leave Earth and go off on this horrendous journey um, and all this great risk? I just want to end the process, my second to last slide, with another tale of people going off into the unknown, which was the Donner Party, who you may have heard of. They're very famous in American folklore of this immigrant party that went from Missouri and tried to go all the way to California. And then they got stuck in a snowstorm and a lot of them perished during the winter in the Sierra Mountains, very close to where I'm sitting right now, actually. So they were kind of a lot like me. They got as far as Reno, Nevada, and then they realized they weren't going to get out alive. But anyway, one of them had died along route. And there's this beautiful passage from this literally like a trapper, a mountain man covered in furs who came across this grave. And when he found it, he sat down and penned this incredible um, passage about what did this mean? And he made the point that I think is just really an insightful comment that what drove her to leave the comforts and the security of society is that our minds are just built to crave novelty. And what I, the point I want to leave you with is that's not just sort of a craving of your soul, but that's really built into the actual fabric of how the senses work. They're literally designed to just ignore the expected, the known properties of the world, and really just highlight and tease your consciousness with things that are new and unexpected. So I apologize that I ran over a bit, um, but thank you for bearing with me. And um, I'm very happy to take questions if anyone has any, but thank you again. Hey, thanks, Mike.